We in church count time differently than others, although every single world religion counts time differently than others. We call today the Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the church year. In the Christian year, as uh, we follow the standard lectionary readings, we count our years in three-year cycles. Now, some of you all know this, and for some, this will be new. So forgive me for telling you one more thing that you already know. There are cycles A, B, and C. A is Matthew's Gospel, which begins next Sunday with this new church year. B is Mark, and C is Luke, which is today. Today, Pentecost ends. The church year ends. Luke's cycle ends. Year C ends at the foot of the cross. Year B ends in the Last Judgment. Year A engages an argument between Pilate and Jesus, but in all honesty, Jesus isn't arguing with Pilate. He's silent as Pilate declares the kingdom of the world not to be his. All three describe the reign of Christ. So no matter what cycle we're in, A, B, or C, we meet at the foot of the cross, where we'll see each other again next year in Jerusalem on this very same day. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We're in a time of seasonal transitions. There's no way to look at this time of year in any other way. The leaves have all fallen, or maybe there's just one or two clinging to the tree in front of your house. The harvest is in. The days darken swiftly now. The first snow has blown across Ohio and landed in Buffalo. Six feet worth our prayers with everyone in that section of the world this morning. As you pass through neighborhoods, you see seasons in transitions as well. I saw something really strange this last week. As I passed by one of my neighbor's houses, they had all the stuff from Halloween still out, and then they had a large blow-up turkey on their front lawn, and then hanging from the front door was the Grinch that stole Christmas, all displayed together. So if you feel a little confused, consider this. None of these season changes matter at all if you bleed scarlet and gray. You're a Buckeye fan, if that's the case. So, because this week is Holy Week for us, right? This is the game week. By Saturday at noon, anyone, anywhere who cares anything about college football will be watching our young Buckeyes win in our 100-year-old Ohio Stadium, which, by the way, was built by the same man who built First Church. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's 145 hours away. But who's counting? Actually, everyone's counting. I hope you're counting. Is anyone else counting, or am I the only one? Come on, raise some hands, please. And if you're not going to raise hands, at least say, O-H. Thank you. Now we're ready for season change. Winter is upon us, and the cycle of the Christian readings has gone all the way around. Christ's reign is upon us as his dying time has come around too. We hear this passage as something that should be read during Holy Week, right? It should be read on Good Friday, and then we come upon it and wonder why here. As we come to this year's end, this violent ending, the execution of our king, we have to look one more time at this story. We find this grounding in the belief in our faith in Jesus Christ comes home to us in the passion narrative of Luke 23. Because Christ reigns, love ultimately wins over hate. Because Christ reigns, kindness wins over unkindness. The victory all is in God's hands and all of the glory goes to God. 
In the words of Jesus to his disciples in the Beatitudes, he says it succinctly and prophetically. Some of the very first words that he speaks in public as a preacher and teacher. In Matthew 5, 11 and 12, he writes and speaks, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. However, reviling, persecution utters its evil words. We have now reached the lowest point in the reign of Christ, tested to the max in the passion of the Christ. Here, Jesus is ridiculed, he's attacked, he's beaten, he's mocked, he's laughed at, and finally he is brutally executed at the hands of the Roman Empire. He is declared King of the Jews by mocking Roman soldiers and cynical Roman leaders. The mocking title, King of the Jews, is publicly displayed over his head. These words are spit and then they're penned as words of disdain and hate. Yet as the leaders and soldiers ridicule Jesus, they all speak more truth than they know. Luke's brevity is impressive here. He understands that the power of this event does not lie in the flow of our tears, but in the flow of Jesus's blood. So Luke provides just the essentials. The place of crucifixion is called the skull. The word to crucify literally means to impale a person on a stake. There on Skull Hill, Jesus is joined in this public execution by two criminals, one on his left and one on his right. The leaders who are present mock him with two titles, Messiah and the Chosen One. Those are titles that are set apart by God as distinctive, not to be mocked. They sneer, he helped others, let him help himself if he's the Christ, the Chosen One. The soldiers who are on assignment just follow their leaders and they play sport with Jesus. The crowd is there too. They have supposedly been with Jesus all along, but now they turn on him because they become, if you will, the silent majority as they watch him and say not a word while he's crucified. Maybe they feel helpless before the combined powers of the state and religion, and maybe they feel that they cannot do anything. Luke will later tell us that Jesus' acquaintances from Galilee, including the women, watch from a distance. Whatever the case, while Jesus is executed, his followers silently retreat in fear. It's never a good sign when people abandon their leader, especially one who has given his entire life to healing, teaching, compassionate care, and kindness, the one who is, in, in fact, the chosen one. Twice Luke turns our attention to the two men who are being crucified on the crosses beside him. The first time Luke does this, he shares Jesus' words of forgiveness, which we always take on as our own. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. But actually, the, the Hebrew is interesting. The Greek is even more so because the they in this prayer is the two men who are on his side. But the prayer ends up covering all who are implicated in his death. The second time our attention is drawn to the cross, it brings us closer as we overhear the conversation among the crucified, one criminal joking and joining the mockers, the other not acknowledging the justice of his punishment and the injustice of the punishment of Jesus. Jesus never responds to the words of rebuke from the one man. He never answers, he never says one word. His words of forgiveness have already covered his response to all of this, including this new hate that has been dumped on him. But to the man who says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he utters his almost last words, so be it, today you will be with me in paradise. Three times Jesus is mocked to save himself and he does not save himself. 
When he acts, he saves another. He saves not himself, but the man beside him. That he saved someone is the point here. We often get stuck in the fact that Jesus doesn't save himself on the cross, but Jesus is true to himself to the very end. He is always about the saving of others. He's always about giving himself to his dying breath to others. For the Son of Man, Luke writes in the 19th chapter, came not to seek out, but came to seek out and save the lost. In death, as in life, Jesus stays true to himself. Just before paradise, we see him just the same as always, compassionate, fully aware of others, forgiving, non-judgmental in the face of abuse, and in love with the world, even as the world is hating on him. We see him as kind. In fact, his promise of salvation to the criminal is a vow of kindness, really. I promise you, today you will be with me in paradise. You and I can learn everything we really need to know about living a life of love and overcoming hate from simply attending to Jesus' dying words and his actions there. We can learn everything we need to know as his followers from his vow of kindness. And as his followers, each and every one of us is called by God to forgive everyone of everything. Let me repeat that. We're called by God as followers of Jesus to forgive everyone of everything. That's mind blowing, but that's the call. Each and every one of us is called by God to be graceful instead of spiteful. Each and every one of us is called by God to be kind rather than cruel. Each and every one of us is called by God to respond with love no matter what another person spits at us verbally or literally. We can treat it as a gift rather than the truth. It's their truth, but it's not the truth. And each and every one of us is called by God to live into the truth that love wins over hate. Each and every one of us is called by God to welcome even the most despicable characters into the embrace of God's love and grace. And each and every one of us is called by God to live to our last breath, to our dying breath, to commend ourselves into God's hands rather than condemn anyone else into the halls of hell. None of these things are optional. At the foot of the cross, while Jesus draws his last breath and we close this year in dedication to his life of care, we need to get this one right. Colossians walks us into paradise with this beautiful hymn of praise given as a gift to the early church facing persecution and death. Colossians 1, 11 through 20 is very clear. The one we are called to follow is actually the greatest image of the living God. It sings of Christ's kingship and power. Christ is presented as the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. This is very powerful because it's not as though he just is born when creation comes. He comes before the entrance of creation into this world and universe. Before all things come into being, Christ is present. He's under the rocks of time, if you will. And in him and all things hold together. Christ is the superglue that holds our family picture through the ages in the album of the Christian story. While the rubber cement of yesteryear may cause, may come to disintegrate, Christ holds everything together. He is the head of the body. He's the head of the church. Frank read it so beautifully. As head over all creation, he is not only the firstborn of creation, but the firstborn from the dead. In him, Paul writes, God is in all things and chooses all things to dwell with us in all things. So all the time, love wins. Today, let's not be fooled by the title of this day, the reign of Christ. The title is really cool. It's superlative. The image we typically create for it 
is flush with symbols of royalty and high priesthood and greatness and grandeur. But as Christians, we don't live in a fairy tale world. Luke's gospel reflects none of that. Today's gospel portrays an apparently impotent Christ, defeated in the eyes of the world, dying in the sight of a God who's not pulling him off the cross. But that's not the end of this story. If we ask which of these images, the royal or the shattered, better reflect our Christ, we have to choose the scripture rather than one we make up because it feels better and looks better and sings better than the rest. As we think about the Christian message, especially on a day like today, it's too easy to fall prey into a fairy tale mode and recall that Christ the King is one who lives happily ever after. This flies in the face of everything that we've heard and read today. It strips Jesus' death of its depth, and it risks portraying his love as shallow, like an enchanted prince of a beautiful princess. After all, Jesus is not Prince Charming, and this is not Snow White. On this reign of Christ Sunday, when we rejoice in our King of the universe, let us remember the real Jesus, rejected and mocked, powerless to stop the violence. Let us remember that he reigned through active love, that he reigned through active compassion, that he reigned through active kindness, and that he suffered unto death. When God raises him, even though he is born again, he carries the marks of his suffering. It was his love that reigned then and continues to reign today. Our faith insists that love is only, is the only power in the universe capable of overcoming evil. As living images of our God, it is that love that alone we are called to remember and make present to others. So let's take the vow of kindness today and follow the risen Christ in everything we do and say.